generational contact, use those to stress those points yeah. and say, beautiful snowy landscape to, uh, to listen to our last presentation and also thank you for uh, people online. Um, so we will have, let's say, Alain present for maybe like 40 minutes, 45 minutes. That gives us a bit of time for Q&A afterwards. Uh, we will check in with the people online uh, if they have questions. Um, if there's burning questions, please don't hesitate to interrupt. Um, so my name is Bas Highwax. I work here on the wildlife team at WFUS, working on African species conservation issues. Worked before most of my career in the Congo Basin region, and I was actually Alain's successor. Uh, predecessor. Uh, so Alain, uh, we are uh, glad uh, that you uh, that you were able to come. Um, uh, Alain uh, is based in Yaoundé, Cameroon, is uh, Cameroonian nationality. Um, Alain has a long career in, in conservation and really working on, let's say, the frontline work of uh, combating wildlife crime. He's a lawyer from training. Before joining WF, he worked uh, for an organization in the Congo Basin region called LAGA. Um, leading their uh, legal department. Uh, then he joined WWF uh, as uh, WF Cameroon's law enforcement advisor, uh, <clears throat> where he really sort of uh, spearheaded uh, our new paradigm of, of, of more, let's say, uh, uh, proactive working with law enforcement agencies uh, on setting up intelligent-based uh, law enforcement support systems. And since now the last, what is it, three years? Yes. Uh, Alain has, uh, is now the head of policy of our wildlife crime program for the Congo Basin region. And it's a program we do jointly with our colleagues in traffic, who also have their regional office in Cameroon for the Congo Basin region. That is part of our global wildlife crime program, which is managed by our wildlife practice of WWF, uh, for which we have uh, regional coordinators based in Asia, East Africa, Central Africa, and Southern Africa. So Alain is, uh, is our focal point for that. Alain's work has basically two main components. One is like a policy component, so keep on uh, that drumbeat with, with the highest levels of governments in that region that wildlife crime is similar to other types of crime and should be treated as such and has impacts on economical development and national security issues. Whereas at the same time, really much more is really also more to set up uh, combating wildlife crime systems. Um, the focus of his work is really in our, let's say, priority areas where wildlife crime is the most rampant and where there is still a lot of our priority species left with a big focus on forest elephants. Uh, so two of those landscapes are in the border areas between the uh, Central African Republic, uh, Cameroon, uh, Northern Congo, Brazzaville and Gabon in two priority landscapes called the TNS and the Tridom landscapes. And uh, maybe with that, Alain, I'll leave it to you. Okay, welcome again. Thank you, thank you, Bas, for the introduction. Um, uh, it's a good afternoon to uh, all of you. I'm happy to be here, uh, despite the, <laughs> the snow outside and the, the cold, <laughs> the cold uh, weather. I'm not, I'm not used to it, but uh, don't worry, it's not going to, uh, to affect me and prevent me to go down. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, thanks for the opportunity that you are giving me to, uh, to present our work in the, in the Congo Basin. Uh, so, uh, I've chosen to, to talk to you about uh, some part of what we are doing, uh, which is specifically on establishing uh, wildlife crime units uh, in order to, uh, to improve uh, the anti-poaching uh, and anti-trafficking work that we are doing on the, on the ground. I'm going to present uh, for less than 45 minutes, so more or less 35 to 40 minutes, so that we have enough time to, uh, to discuss. Uh, initially, I, I wanted to talk to you about figures and facts concerning the scope of wildlife crime, but I'm sure that you have, some of you have heard about it 10, 10 times. Uh, but the recent news just uh, made me to uh, uh, to start by talking about what just happened uh, yesterday or, or today, which is uh, the record seizure, as you, as you can read, of eight tons of pangolin scales and uh, more than a thousand of elephant tusks. It happened uh, today in, in Hong Kong. Just that uh, illustrates how deep or how serious wildlife crime still is. 
And uh, according to what has been said, uh, this shipment is coming from Nigeria, which is funny because there are, there are no, <laughs> almost no air farms left in, in, in Nigeria. Uh, but it shows that we are really dealing with uh, international crime because the, those elephant tusk and pangolin scales are coming from the region where we are working, that is, that is Congo Basin. So it shows that uh, the world of crime is still an international issue, uh, transnational organized crime. But where we work at the source level, uh, it's still a problem because we don't yet manage to have a good coordinated response. And uh, definitely, uh, we are less effective in, uh, in, uh, in tackling uh, the world of crime issue. So um, it's, it's an issue that is linked with other forms of trafficking, unfortunately. Arm trafficking, drug trafficking, so then posing a serious threat on the national stability of, of those states, and also on the ecotourism, and definitely on the people living close to the wildlife, which is the local communities. So uh, it's a serious issue, and uh, we really need to, to, to deal with it. Now, I just want to illustrate a little bit because uh, the seriousness of the issue by taking the elephant, the forest elephant crisis. Uh, forest elephant is, um, is seriously affected because uh, in the space of 10 years, from 20, 2002 to 2011, we have lost almost two thirds of the population of elephant due to commercial poaching. And uh, it's even worse in some other parts of the region where we have uh, presented losses up to 90, 90%. We are talking of southeast of Cameroon in natural protected areas like Niki, Bubambek, for you who know very well the, the, the region. And as you can see, uh, and as I said previously, it is linked with arm trafficking because you can see the amount of arms that are being seized and bullets. Uh, this is a picture of, uh, of only one seizure where of 1,000 AK-47 bullets. That, was, that happened in 2015 in uh, near to Lobeke, uh, to the border going to, uh, into, to a town called Mulundu, to the border going to Congo. So uh, it's really, really, really serious. Still on elephants, we have an estimated population now of 80, 85,000 forest elephants. Uh, and um, more, almost half of it in the areas where we work. Despite the dramatic decline, it is, it's still a significant population because this is, for a country like Gabon, for instance, they have us half of the total forest elephant population. So we still have like strong hold, good strongholds of, uh, of elephant population. That's really uh, where the needs and how the needs to still continue to improve the anti poaching and anti trafficking work on the ground. But unfortunately, as I said, uh, the, we, we, are ex we are experiencing and seeing largest ivory seizures. The last top three in the, in the last two years happened in Cameroon with a total of 500 tusk that have been seized. 216 in one seizure, 156 in another one, and uh, more or less 80 in, in, uh, in the third one. And so with this rate, if nothing is done, it's been done, or if things are not improved, we are expecting, unfortunately, the local, uh, even national extinction of forest elephant in the next five to 10 years. So uh, it's extremely, it's extremely serious. Uh, but unfortunately also, it's not only about elephants. You have so many other species that are targeted. I've talked already about pangolin scales. You can see back of pangolin scales on the top left. But there are other species. You see Africa gray parrots in the middle. You see apes in a life as pets or dead. You see leopard skin. You see uh, tortoise, tortoise shells. So it's really, uh, it's really something that is touching many endangered, endangered species. So with all this, um, uh, we, we think that this is the time more than in the past to, uh, to really have this game change, to really improve the work on the ground, to really curb this, uh, uh, this poaching. And now some of the key obstacles to uh, effective wildlife conservation uh, uh, 
the, the, the first one, the fact that we are working in, in states that are very weak. Uh, some are really, <clears throat> like we can say, failed state. So many social political unrest, like CIA, uh, to some extent, DRC, it's, it's the, 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 uh, the, 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 those states are not really strong in uh, managing their wildlife, the, the wildlife system, the, 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 in putting in place good system to manage the wildlife populations. The enforcement capacity is very low, uh, the material, the equipment, but also sometimes the training <coughs> is really low. There's no real good interagency collaboration between, because the wildlife crime issue goes really above only the control of the wildlife administration. There is a need to collaborate deeply between wildlife, police, justice, custom, and the justice. So also the, 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 the issue of human wildlife conflict, because we are dealing in places where the wildlife is really, population is really closed to local communities. And we need to have communities on our side. They need to be really part of the, the solution. So if the mitigation of the human wildlife conflict is not there, we are not going to have the involvement of those, com of those communities in protection efforts, which is really key. I'm going to talk a little bit about it later. We have corruption, unfortunately rampant corruption in those, in those places. Complicity with local law enforcement agents being part of the criminal network, sometimes providing the guns, the ammunitions to, to kill the animals. We have the disparities between the national laws. Uh, you have different penalties from one country to the other, from one border to the other. Six months imprisonment maximum in Gabon, five years in Congo, three years in Cameroon. It's not, uh, you, have, you have this. But also the fact that the wildlife crime are sometimes less punished by other types of crime. So people really see that it's a kind of uh, low risk, high profit uh, activity. So it's also an issue. And uh, finally, the insufficient involvement of the judiciary. Because despite the fact that the laws are there, in some countries they are good, like in Congo, five years, but it's still difficult for the, for the judiciary, for the magistrate to apply those maximum penalties. So these are some of the key obstacles. There are others, but uh, this, these are really some that are, 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 really, are really critical. Um, so now, um, we uh, really thought that it's important, unlike in the past, where the traditional support was mostly on providing financial and technical support to the wildlife agents for them to carry out patrol with more or less no real kind of uh, follow up of the result of what was going on. So we kind of now uh, having a, an, a holistic approach. So this is really our theory of change. Be able to work simultaneously on those six pillars, uh, providing support on assessment to be able to have a good assessment of the effectiveness in the management of protected areas for adaptive management, also promoting good models in, in the management of protected areas. Second one, technology, really to be able to promote or support the use of best and of available tools for to improve the effectiveness of uh, of the patrols of the enforcement activities the third one improving the capacity increasing the capacity of the frontline staff of the rangers but also at the same time advocating for them to have a really really uh, better uh, working uh, to have really really better conditions working conditions and welfare the fourth one community as I said, having community on our side for them to really play the role, the stewardship role, having the responsibility of, of protecting the, the, the wildlife populations and also mitigating the human wildlife conflict. I've talked about that. Prosecution, the fifth one, very importantly, to making sure that the laws that are there are effectively applied, sensitization of, of, uh, of the magistrate, of judges, but also working with experienced lawyers to. Uh, support the wildlife administration in judiciary procedures. And the last one, cooperation, really having all the stakeholders together at the national and regional level, exchange of information, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a really the theory of change. And in the next slide, I'm going to tell you how all, the, all those pieces, what we do concretely 
in each of these pillars so that you see really that uh, uh, it's not a standalone. It's really to have all the six pillars being applied uh, simultaneously. Now, concerning uh, specifically the wildlife crime unit, so this is a kind of overview of what are those units on, on the ground. So, in uh, unfortunately, the pointer uh, was today is still working. So, I'm going to try and explain. So, what you have in, in blue sky are the key, the three key elements of the, the units. Those are WF staff. So, you have the wildlife community coordinator, the legal advisor, and the intelligence officer. So, the, the coordinator is working closely with the park warden, what we also call the conservator, the park manager, uh, in terms of um, uh, surveillance system being applied, uh, planning of patrols, things like that. And uh, this is uh, transmitted to rangers who are the ones to carry out the, the actions on the ground. So this is, this is part of the surveillance system. But if you have a good surveillance system, this is also because you have an intelligence, a good intelligence gathering system, which is working, uh, working very well. So that's the role of the intelligence officer. To make, to make sure that all the mechanisms the, to, uh, to select, to put in place informal network are in place, selection of the, the people, management, confidentiality, uh, making sure that their identities get close, things like that. So this is part of the intelligence gathering system. So good system, as I said, is contributing to an effective surveillance system. And then, if both are working well, those results are supposed to, to go to the judiciary system. So we need to have prosecutions of the people and definitely with the support of private lawyers. So this is the whole, the, the whole shape, the way it, it works. So in Blue Sky, as I said, WS staff, the uh, wildlife people who are really the one responsible to have the activities being uh, implemented on the ground and key collaborators, the private lawyers and the informant network. So where are the units? Now, uh, the aim first is to have five units established and functional in the Congo Basin. Uh, where you see the, the panda logos is where we are planning to have those units. For now, there are two that are operational. I don't have the point that, but I, so this one and this one are the two that are operational. Uh, one in Sierra in Zangasanga area, uh, and the second one uh, in in uh, in Wabalindoki in North Congo. So this is uh, part of the TNS for those of you who know the region. So the one in Sierra is managed uh, by us and all this is, is functionally uh, thanks to our support, and the one in in Congo is managed by WCS. So the idea is to have the other three two in, in Cameroon, one on the TNS side and one on the, on the Tridom side, and the second one in North Congo, uh, also on the Tridom side of, uh, of Congo. And uh, the idea is to really have those units working together, communicating amongst other in terms of exchange of information. I'm going to talk about it a bit, uh, a bit later. So now let us, I'm going to explain it a bit more how the three pillars so intelligence gathering, surveillance, and judiciary follow-up, how they works. So starting with the intelligence gathering. So this sketch is a little bit to tell you first the importance of having a good intelligence network system in place and how it can improve your, uh, this, the, this, the, the surveillance system and also the anti-poaching work and anti-trafficking work. So I, I don't know if you can read from, from the back, so you have the endangered wildlife area, the, the big one, inside which you have the protected areas, so where you have your animals, but unfortunately also where you have the, the bad guys, because they are targeting where you have the resources. So uh, you have what where we call the poaching hotspot. Those are the poaching hotspot. And close to the poaching hotspot, now you have the trading uh, area where when they the products are removed from the animal, they are stopped before now, taking uh, the hold out of the endangered wildlife range and out of the country. For instance, the case of the seizure that happened in, in Hong Kong, 
it was said that it's coming from Nigeria. So you can have your neighboring country here, but it's not, it, it, the, the, the situation starts a bit earlier where the poaching is happening and subsequently where the trafficking is, is happening. So the idea is to have your informal inf information system at the trading nodes. Usually where it's also, uh, also the, 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 the way the, the, or the, 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 uh, the routes that the poachers are taking to enter the protected areas and coming back with the product. So it's good to have your information system there in order to provide the enforcement people, the rangers, and uh, later on, the other enforcement agencies, police, gendarmerie, providing them with effective, actionable information. So this is a little bit how, how it works in order to stop them from moving out of the endangered uh, wildlife range and later on to move out of the out of the country. So concretely, what do we do? What the what, what is what the wildlife community does is training the park managers, the park warden, also the head of the units, uh, the, the people who are in charge of managing the ranger units on how to select, to establish and manage in information networks. So that's the first thing. The other one is to now supporting the establishment of those network, those network, those informal network, who are basically uh, mostly or uh, made of the community members. This is also to show the importance of, ha of having the community on your side for them to be able to provide uh, information when they come across, uh, across those. Also putting in place community hotlines, because it's not, it's not always a given to have a network, but when people know, have the, the stewardship to protect the wildlife, they're also keen to like use hotlines to denounce, to, uh, to provide information. And another important one is to work on the human wildlife conflict mitigation aspect that I've been talking about earlier. So now the second one is the effective surveillance. And here concretely, uh, it covers two pillars of the approach, the technology one and the capacity one. So on the capacity one, it's to train the ranger, and, but also not only training, not only providing the skills, but also to mentor and making sure that the skills that they have acquired are effectively used on the ground. So the aspects, some of the aspect, the training aspect include organization, discipline, but an important one and more and more is the respect of human rights in anti poaching, data collection, navigation, and all the stuff. The second one is the provision of patrolling equipment because the, 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 the best the, train, the, the trainers, the trainees can be if they don't have the corresponding materials, they are not going to be able to apply what uh, they have acquired as, uh, as, uh, as knowledge. So some of the equipment include in which, which is a, a, patrol, a patrolling device to, uh, to really know where your teams are, to hire out for other outfits. And the third one is advocacy uh, for better ranger working conditions. And this is mostly about my work to really advocate at the national, sometimes regional, even international level, that those guys are working in very difficult conditions. They need to have better equipment, better uh, living conditions, better welfare. Uh, so you can see uh, some of the pictures of the training. This is, uh, the, this one is the, the training team arriving in Zangasanga. Uh, to do the training. This is a training on the, the, of the sniffer dog uh, unit. And the, these are the, this is a training uh, on, on the ranger on some of the patrolling exercises. Uh, you have other ones. This is an in-class training here in the field using uh, SMART and uh, other cyber tracker and other uh, navigation tools. The third, as the third pillar is the judiciary follow-up. And here it covers both capacity and the prosecution pillar. So capacity, still training, capacity building on laws and procedures. How to really draft a good offense statement, how to build a strong 
case file, how to secure and produce the evidence in court, how to represent the administration in court, how to be a witness, a good witness in court. Uh, this is for the ranger, but on the other side, for the, for the justice people, the magistrate, the prosecutor, is to keep on sensitizing them on really the magnitude of wildlife crime. The fact that it's not only a, a matter of killing an animal, but it goes really above, above that, and that they should really apply the penalties that are provided by, by the law. They should not have lenient sentences, things like that. Working with experienced lawyers is extremely important. I've talked about that also. To be able to monitor the court cases from the beginning, so from really from the time the, the suspect are arrested till when the decision is given. And uh, we are even going further now. We are now providing support even on the recovery of damages. It's not for us, because we are not part party in the court case, but for the wildlife administration. Because we believe that it's definitely when those damages are recovered that it's, it's really, it, it really hurts the, 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 the suspect. It's really something that, and it's really a compensation for, for the damages that have been, uh, uh, that have been, uh, uh, that have been suffered because of, uh, of poaching and, and trafficking. So here you see uh, one uh, female ranger who is taking off after a training and uh, down uh, the training uh, of uh, rangers and, uh, and magistrates. Um, another aspect which is not part of the wildlife community, but which is complementary, as I told you, it's a combination of doing a good job on the ground, but also having this coordination at the regional level, which is mostly uh, part of my job, as uh, Bas mentioned in the introduction. So having this coordination being done, also coalition building. Here, this is a, a joint statement uh, that has been uh, developed following the seizure of 210 uh, elephant ivory and uh, 216 uh, elephant ivory and H1 elephant tusk. It happened in December 2017. It was really a, one of the largest in Cameroon. I've talked about that in uh, the beginning. And so we, we managed to bring all the key conservation organizations together to have this joint statement to alert the authorities that this is something that is increasingly alarming and we need to do something uh, against it to, um, to recognize the effort because it's not easy to have this type of result when you, you have an environment full of corruption, the fact that uh, there, is a, there, there are a lot of bribing attempts, and to, to also call for more actions, especially at the level of judiciary, for those people to be really prosecuted. And the consequence of it was that, first of all, the, those, those guys were really prosecuted with heavy penalties, three years imprisonment. Uh, it happened in May, so more or less five months after this seizure. So it's to show that if you are speaking the same language, if you are really pushing the, the people, something can be, can, can be done. But we need to do more of this type of, uh, of transitement instead of sometimes competing amongst ourselves. It's really important to have this joint uh, advocacy. So uh, concretely, apart from what I've said, what we do is to be able to have this information sharing between the units. They, they need to communicate amongst them, exchange it in, exchanging information, because those networks are unfortunately not working in specific areas. Those are opportunistic people who can sometimes work in Sierra, then work in Gabon, in, in, Cam in Cameroon, and sometimes working simultaneously in those countries. So it's good to have this exchange of information. Uh, more internally, for us as WF, promoting this learning and sharing, capacity building to have a good expertise on the, on the ground. And this is also part of my, my, my job because I'm trying to transfer the expertise that I've, I've, I've acquired uh, since I'm in law enforcement support to other colleagues so that we really have a good team of guys on the ground in order for them to also transfer the skills to our government counterpart. On the external side of things, promoting really the use of best practices and to see how what is working well in, in a country can also be replicated in another one. Uh, 
the use of data is also important <clears throat> because we need to be a kind of repository of, of the data on, on anti-poaching and anti-trafficking uh, to increase our visibility, to be able to really produce good uh, reports uh, uh, to, to, to alert when, they are, when the trends are really alarming to do that. And uh, finally, uh, to have this coalition building, uh, coming back to the example that I, I gave for this joint, joint, joint statement when the, the, the things happen. So this is basically what we are doing, and uh, uh, we are really hoping to be able to establish the other three units to really make those operational, and uh, it requires more resources, but uh, I think we are going to make it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alain. Um, I think we have a couple of people in this room and also online that are relatively well versed in this type of work. Um, specifically, thanks to also our government partners that are with us. So, yeah, with this, I think we can sort of open the floor to maybe more technical questions or more geographically focused questions for people that have those. Um, and maybe we can see if there's already a question or questions from the people that are joining us online. <clears throat> yes, go ahead. Uh, okay. Thank you, Alain. Great presentation. Um, I'm uh, Andy Tobias and at USAID. Um, the, the picture of the bridge and also the diagram of the wildlife crime unit structure did not include um, an explicit mention of police. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about the role of police, because I know that in many countries, um, police actually do the arrest and the charging after the apprehension by the rangers. And um, if they don't come, then that's a break in the chain. So I'm just curious about what is their role? Are they, do they have a defined um, role in the wildlife crime unit? Mm. Okay. Should I answer that? Sure, yeah. After? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the question. I think it's a very important one. Well, for the police, Yes, they have an important role to play. And as I said, uh, fighting wildlife crime is no more only the, the mandate or the role or the responsibility of the wildlife crime administration, the wildlife administration alone. So there are other enforcement agencies and police is one of them. You have also gendarmerie, I think it's a term that is not used by all the countries, but those who are used to the region they know about police gendarmerie, the custom also. So talking specifically about the wildlife crime units, the, the police, they are not um, part, part of it because we are not in the protected area. If I talk specifically about the work in the protected area, we are not directly working with the police. The police are usually joining the rangers in some of the patrols because of the, the fact that they are better equipped, sometimes better disciplined, uh, than uh, the, 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 the wildlife administration. And when I talk about the police here, I, I'm really talking largely police, military, I, I put them in the same, in the, in the, in the same pot. So they are joining the, the rangers to do the work, but, but everything should be planned earlier by, by, the, the, by the rangers, by the, the, the patrol, the, the park wardens, and then the police is uh, joining. But on the anti-trafficking side of the thing, this is where sometimes the police are having a more immediate role because they can come across some of the of those consignments when the wildlife people are not there, if, or also sometimes when they are there. Uh, and this is how uh, why I've, I was talking about having joint actions together them sitting with the wildlife people in joint capacity building session, joint training, not only to share or to have the same skills, but also to kind of promoting the fact that they should speak together, they should talk together, to have the habit of, of, uh, of sitting together. And uh, for instance, when something is, um, an operation is carried out by the police, that they should have this um, uh, reflex of contacting the wildlife guys in order just to identify 
which species are we talking about? What is the gravity of the offense and stuff like that? And also to be able to exchange information uh, because the, the wildlife people cannot come across everything. But if the information I exchange, not just with the police, but with the others, customs sometimes are the only one at the airport. The police is not there. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of really having this kind of um, uh, more joint activities in room with trainings, but also outside with having kind of joint operations happening on, on the ground. So the, the police are among those being trained and obviously yes. raising yeah. awareness. Exactly. Yeah. You're having success, would you say, in Cameroon? Uh, the, with the police, for instance, yes, and the custom also. Some of those seizures that I've mentioned were done by the customs, not by the wildlife administration. So uh, the, the more they are, they are aware of the gravity, the more they are able to identify the contraband products, the more we can have good behaviors. And I think also to specify is those, those wildlife crime units, those are these three people, expert teams that are NGO people. Right. Mm -hmm. So they are just basically sort of an additional layer on top of the protected area management people on those different field sites and cover larger geographical areas and bring that additional, let's say, NGO support to those park teams, whether they are government or NGO staff. Um, and in terms of law enforcement, uh, agents that benefit from that capacity, they include indeed all the different law enforcement forces that are a physical presence in those border areas between <coughs> those four countries. There's, there's a project that we are implementing now on, in Tridom, which is basically on uh, supporting these, those capacity building sessions uh, between the, um, the enforcement agents working in border areas. So some of those areas have been selected, like uh, for those of you who know the region, in, in South Cameroon, uh, and areas like Jum, Mintong, Tam, uh, Weso, Oyem in Gabon. So they have been se uh, selected. Those who are working on, 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 on controlling, on doing this control uh, work, so they have been selected. We did a kind of um, feasibility study where we recorded all the staff who are working. And they are, they are invited nominatively. So we need this one, we need this one. They come and sit in the same room and they are trained together in order for them, as I said, to first of all, uh, acquiring the same skills, but also having this use of working together, exchanging uh, contacts, knowing that they have the tools uh, exchange, exchange information tools like the Af uh, Africa Tricks, which is a, an information tool that is managed by traffic, but also other tools like Echo Message of Interpol, ETIS of CITES, having knowing what, how to use and when to use those 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 information exchange tools. I also want to just add something to clarify. In most cases in Central Africa, the rangers do have the judiciary responsibility of law enforcement. So the police just do there to enforce it, but they can make arrests. Can they, arrest. they, yeah. they are in most cases what they call asamante, which means that they, yeah. they have limited police function, but they do, and they are in many cases are also paramilitary. So they have the right to bear arms and stuff like that. Not in every single country, it varies a little bit different than the region, but they are they are police officers basically. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. It was a good presentation. Um, First of all, I want to commend you and other partners for the collaboration with the WCS, um, Africa Parks, and WWF. It was interesting this morning, I received the ABCG newsletter, and they're advertising a shared position for a capacity coordinator. Yeah, in Congo. Yeah, and I, I just thought that was great, and that's the kind of approach, as you highlighted, that we need to see more often. If you look at countries and regions where there's been change, it's where there's a systems level approach that's adopted by all partners and you know sort of speaking with that you know unified voice and things so i just think that's really positive um i have a question so you now have two functional wildlife crime units and i don't know how long they've been functioning 
but have they been functioning long enough that you're seeing a change? So what was it like prior to having those in place and what has changed today? What's happening and what has been the impact? Okay. Uh, the first one was the one in Congo mm -hmm. by WCS and we learned a lot from, from that one. Uh, so the second one is the one in, in, in Sierra, uh, which is uh, functioning for now, let's say one and a half year. Uh, because I'm not, I'm just talking about when the first, uh, the, 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 the training team started to come, when the, 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 the people uh, of the, the unit were recruited, uh, things like that. So, uh, and it was established gradually, because it's also a problem of uh, finding the good expertise yeah. in the region, it's not a given. So it was established gradually. Uh, we had the, the intelligence officer guy who was there. Then we have a jurist who was there. And most recently, the coordinator of the wildlife community was recruited. And uh, now the, 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 the impact, I think that's the second yeah. part of your, of your question. The impact is, first of all, <clears throat> for, for CAR, for instance. CAR is, I can say, is one of our success stories now in the region. And it's a big uh, it's a paradox because we are talk we are talking of a state which is uh, more or less almost a failed one when oh, things are not working <laughs> well. <laughs> it's less than any. Yeah, yeah. We can say. except except maybe in the capital city Bangui and where we are working. So it's really also uh, to show that governance can work uh, even where in the, where. It doesn't work in other places, but if some of the components, key components are there, it doesn't just serve the purpose of conservation, but it also really serve the purpose of promoting the rule of law, making, have, making sure that good governance systems are in place. Concretely speaking, we are having very low level of poaching in Sierra. Not yet zero, because it's almost impossible to have zero, but very, very low level of poaching there. You have a good judiciary system working. You have a, a, a judiciary database um, regularly managed. You have lawyers who are there. And also more important is that there is a good response of the community. So we have really good, uh, I didn't put those pictures, but I have pictures of where you have really good sessions where the communities are there, they are participating. We have also good ecosystem, ecotourism system and, uh, working, uh, which is also an asset. Um, so I may say that they have, they have really improved things. And also, the fact that we are having dedicated WF staff working on those issues, which has not been the case in the past, because we are, we are having people working on so many different issues, including anti -poaching. So you have now three people who are there only for that, supporting on almost a daily, daily basis. It's sure that with time, you are going to refine all those facts to really see the the difference between there and uh, in other places or in and or there the difference between the past and now but we can already see the fruits of uh, and I, I just think that'll be really important i know it's early on mm -hmm. because if you want to replicate this in other sites mm -hmm. if you have that data showing before and after or also just some of the thing new activities you're doing that you weren't able to do before it'll be a really um compelling yeah. um, argument for getting additional funding and establishing sure. this or modified wildlife crime units elsewhere. Add some, yeah. Thanks. Um, I've got two questions from online, both from the same person. One, is there engagement of private foreigners on the ground, Chinese working around mines, et cetera, and forestry companies? And the second question is, I am wondering if the successes are based on seizures or whether they are able to thwart poaching with intelligence and make arrests before the animals are killed. Can we repeat the first yeah. one? <laughs> one, 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 one? Yeah, I'll do one at a time. Uh, yeah. The first one is, is there engagement of private foreigners on the ground? For example, Chinese working around mines, etc., and forestry companies. Mm. Um, I think the... When it comes, unfortunately, when it comes to uh, to anti poaching, we have the involvement of those of those uh, uh, of those stakeholders, the logging companies, mining companies. Sometimes their employees are 
sometimes involved in in the anti in the in the poaching activities and in the trafficking activities. We have had cases, for instance, of Asian people from Vietnam, from China being seized with pangolin scales, with ivory. Unfortunately, that that's the case. But um, having the engagement, I may say they are trying to do in terms of promoting best practices, saying that okay, it's not good to be involved. In those things, this is one thing that is happening. I, I may recognize, but uh, also individuals are. Some of the individuals are, are, are finding themselves being uh, uh, being involved in those in those activities. And one thing that we are also advocating now at the at more national level is this kind of zero tolerance because. Sometimes the treatment is different between arresting a local guy, a, a villager, who has, because he has killed an elephant, and being able to prosecute somebody a little bit, a little bit high up because he has been seized with uh, uh, a big quantity of uh, beanie tusk or, or pangolin skin. It, 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 it's, not, it's not the same thing. And also, I've talked about an environment full of corruption, because those guys, they are ready, even when they are arrested, to give cash to the rangers for them to be arrested. Uh, even when the case goes to court, sometimes they are also giving a lot of money for the judges, for the, to the prosecutor, for, the, for them to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be released and not to face, the, to face the law. So it's a kind of tricky issue it's, it's difficult to say yes they are fully fully engaged there are actions that they show to say okay we are promoting best practices within our companies but also on the contrary you find yourself having those the same individual or individuals working in the same companies to being involved in the illegal activities i don't know if it, if it answers the question yeah but maybe also i think on the positive side you could also mention that for instance, most logging companies, I believe in the, in, in, in the landscape like the TNS, which is this whole World Heritage Site, not only heritage site status for the protected areas in that landscape, but also for the, for the production forests in that landscape, uh, are, are, are certified, FSC certified. And, mm -hmm. and that means that they have to set up, let's say, proper management systems, including with regard to biodiversity management and wildlife management. Mm -hmm. And th they, they manage huge areas. Um, together with the forest administration and have set up indeed this anti-bushmeat or anti-hunting policy so that indeed uh, like bushmeat uh, hunting in their concessions is forbidden, uh, mm. implication of, 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 of their workers in bushmeat hunting or ivory poaching immediately mm. results in being fired uh, and setting up let's say privately managed protection systems that their infrastructure is not being used by poachers to go in and out of those forests. So maybe it's in many cases not perfect mm. but at least uh, it is a privately managed, let's say, uh, system which collaborates with the forest administration with, with support from NGOs like ourselves. Uh, that, that without their help, I mean, we wouldn't be able to do that job. They are managing really much larger areas than those protected areas. Uh, and, and it is not always uh, shown that elephant poaching in protected areas uh, are, is lower uh, than in those, uh, those, uh, those forest concessions managed by logging companies. So. And in the same line, in a country like Congo, for instance, you, you have rangers who are contracted by those logging companies and yeah. paid by them yeah. doing the surveillance work on the ground. And the second question? Um, the second question is about the successes you've seen, if you've seen them only with the seizures, or if you've seen them with the intelligence you've used. Um, on the ground before the animals are killed. I, I, I think the, the, the success should be uh, should be seen differently. Uh, the, the amount of seizures and arrests can not only uh, show the success; it can just say the level of surveillance that you that you provide. But uh, it's difficult to measure the success only with that. What we usually do is we combine it with, um, with wildlife surveys data, really, because the, the end goal is what? Is to have good populations of animals, viable or stable at least, or increasing populations of, of, of animals. So um, in terms of arrest and seizures, 
at a time where having kind of increasing numbers and uh, then it goes it started going down so but it's difficult just to say because it's increasing it's because of the effectiveness of a surveillance system or or because it's decreasing it's because those guys are not working very well or because they are less butcher. there's still this discussion around the enforcement data that's the reason why they should be really analyzed on the long run you cannot analyze enforcement data after six months and say okay i'm doing a good job i've, I've saved all the elephants no we need to, to really analyze it on the long run. Now we are having, uh, if I take the case of Cameroon and Congo, we are now having consistent law enforcement data in Cameroon for the past five years, in Congo for the past four years. And now we are able to kind of say that, okay, we, and that, that's what I've just saying that we had this type of increasing level of arrest and seizures in the past three years, then after three years, it started going a little bit down. But still, we can't make a, an easy conclusion by saying that it's because of this, it's because of, of that. What, uh, uh, something that we are, that's really positive, is the combination of actionable information and effective operations. It means that the more you can have actionable information and having the people being able to act upon and having good seizures, at least you know that your system is functioning very well. You know that if you come across an information, you have people who are able to put the machine uh, in place in order to have those hours. Those three largest seizures I've talked about is because of the informant, informant network. You cannot have this type, but well, not that you cannot, but it's really difficult to have this type of seizure only by chance of having the rangers being in a fixed patrol coming across 216 tusk is is difficult those people were were were, were work, working overnight at a time when they know that the enforcement the control is very weak is very low they're working overnight they were carrying huge amount of of cash but the information was there already and the team was reinforced in order to prevent those type of issues. So it's only when you can have this fun system really function easily, good in, uh, information being gathered, easy transmission, that's, all, that's also a challenge. You can have information, but by the time it comes to the level of uh, the enforcement people, the guys, they are gone and even the type of response that you can bring after it's finished, you find nothing. So having this fluency in terms of communication, it's, uh, I think that's for us, as that, that this is something that we see for now as the positive, the positiveness of the system. Later on, we may uh, uh, analyze better and conclude if uh, the whole system is, uh, is really having an, an impact on the water. I also have a question with regard to the, the, the transboundary and transnational aspect of, of poaching in those regions. We all talk about it, we all say that, uh, that, that poachers cross borders, etc. But the, the data in those two operational wildlife crime units and the fact that we are now sort of co uh, collating that data also on a regional level, do, you, do that data actually show that? Can you give a few examples of, of indeed uh, poachers that, you ha that have been intercepted or are arrested in different countries and yes and intermediaries that, that we have we, just one we have a famous case of sanga the the the, the, the two sanga borders uh, uh sanga rene and i don't know if i'm i'm, I'm allowed to give the names but <laughs> <laughs> but those are people with consistent uh records in the inf informant database and in the judicial database that systematically been recorded in Sierra, in Cameroon, in Congo. So, and those, some of those data were even given to the justice, given to the to the lawyers, and the lawyers <coughs> were able to actually cross check and show the evidence in court, telling to the ju judges that we are not talking about people only working in Lobeke. We have two years they were arrested in in this. Sometimes not them physically. But people were arrested and citing their names, things like that. So with, with those, this is only one case. 
we have another one of people uh, who are working in South Cameroon saying clearly that they used to go to to North Congo or North Gabon, uh, and sometimes saying that when a, an illegal activity is committed, in order to ev uh, to ev ev evade the law or uh, 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 facing lower penalties, they cross and go to Gabon, hoping that even if they are arrested, they are going to face maximum six months penalties. So we are having this type of uh, clear evidence of one, that those people are, are moving from one country to the other, and that they are able to control, uh, control this, the, 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 the many places uh, in different countries. Yes. I have two quick questions. Um, you say we have, you have two wildlife crime units so far and you're planning on establishing three more. Mm -hmm. Can you speak a little bit about any plans you have to link the units together and how they plan to share information if there is this sort of, there's a frequent flyer list of poachers in the area? Um, and then second off, uh, could you talk a little bit about, um, you know, you're setting up these units with the three personnel WWF personnel adjacent to the park structure. Um, can you talk a little bit about any of your uh, experience in sort of um, protecting them um, from the poachers in the communities? Uh, because if they are operating in this sort of uh, mentoring and advising role and helping the judiciary and helping develop intelligence, mm -hmm. that can mark them for um, potentially uh, negative consequences um, by the community if they're you know con consistently putting away members for doing poaching. Yeah. Good question. What the, the first one, how linking the, the units, I think, well, the, the, the plans uh, on establishing the units and then how to link them. Uh, establishing the units, it requires more resources. That's the reason why, for example, here. Yeah. <laughs> it requires more resources to have those people being recruited. Uh, it's it's a challenge, but uh, we think that we are going to uh, to, uh, to to make it. The, the 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 second one is since all those staff are adopted staff, and I've talked about coordination, we are really having a, a coordination system in place. Uh, another um, another term that we are using now is the wildlife camp hub, which is purely an internal. Uh, terminology, you see kind of facilitation and coordination mechanism. And through the hubs, we are going to have um, a capacity building system in place for our key staff to be, uh, for their capacity to be reinforced in some of the specific areas that I've talked about. But also having this system of, um, of uh, exchanging on uh, who is doing what, if there is something that is functioning well in, in Syria, for instance, I've, I've mentioned the collaboration with a, a team called, uh, coming from a, 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 an organization called Shengeta. Those people are maybe able to go to another unit and train on, same, on the same topics or on different topics, depending on the context there, but all this has to be facilitated by some, by, 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 by a, a mechanism, which is now going to be part of what the hub will, will do. Uh, so having this capacity building, learning and sharing uh, stuff for those guys to communicate uh, uh, together. But this not, does not mean that we, we need to have the people in place in order to say we have the unit. We have staff who are there already. Uh, it's just a matter of redefining what they should do. We are having them being focused on what they should do instead of being sometimes everywhere and at the end of the nowhere. So it's, it's important to, to, have, to have it uh, uh, gradually. Uh, even in Sierra, as I said, the three people were not available at the same time. They were not recruited the same month or the same, no. It's really something that is gradual. As I said, the challenge is to really have the key expertise in the region. We are not the only one. Even the other players, they found it difficult to secure with it, 
key expertise in, in law enforcement support. Now, the protection of the staff. Uh, maybe I didn't mention that. We, in WWF, we have developed a whole protocol, for instance, of managing informal information network with all the aspects related to uh, securing the communication, first of all, between the staff and the, the potential or the confidential informant the confidentiality of the identity of those guys uh, who are not staff, the real staff, when, when it comes to in, uh, the informants. Uh, so those protocols exist to mitigate the risk of having our staff exposed. Now, when it comes to surveillance, we are not really involved in conducting the patrol being on the ground, but that does not mean that there is also zero kind of uh, risk. Uh, as far as you are involved in law enforcement support, you cannot have a kind of zero risk system in place, but it's just uh, a matter of um, uh, preventing our staff to go into deep and risky operations on, on, on the ground. And on the judiciary aspect, it's more a matter of um, uh, assessing what the lawyers are doing sitting with them sometime in terms of uh, uh, analyzing the court cases in place. And that one, I, I don't, from my experience of, of supporting judicial for, for more than 10 years now, it's, it's, it doesn't have a risk to do that. I can maybe, maybe, maybe before you reply, because I see now in terms of timing, we're already five minutes over time. So people that are want to leave or have other engagements, um, uh, I will, we would like to thank them for being here. Uh, people on the line as well as, unless there is maybe one last question from people online, they're not. So others that will still want to continue to talk with Alain, uh, please uh, be free to stay. But people that are, need to go somewhere else, thank you so much. And um, if there's any other questions you don't want to ask now, you can always ask them to Alain or myself and we make sure that they, they, they come back. And I'm still around. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Yeah, I can just maybe just add one aspect that um, they, 